The first we heard of it was a noise like a hurricane coming from the north, and the pine trees on the mountain creaking and cracking in the wind. Some of the dwarves who happened to be outside, well, from a good way off, we saw the dragon settle on our mountain and a spout of flame. Then he came down the slopes, and when he reached the woods, they all went up in fire. By that time, all the bells were ringing in Dale, and the warriors were arming. The dwarves rushed out of their great gate, but there was the dragon waiting for them. None escaped that way. This description of the attack of the dragon Smaug on the city of Dale comes from J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. Tolkien, a translator and lover of European myth, likely took inspiration from the Norse story of Fafnir the dragon and Sigurd the dragon slayer when writing the creature Smaug. In most civilizations the world over, the dragon represents the forces of nature and chaos. But in Europe, particularly medieval Europe, the ideas of untamed nature and chaos are similar or the same, and through the dragon are represented as negative things to be subdued and conquered. In most European traditions, the dragon is a terrible creature that needs to be destroyed. It skulks at the edges of civilization, watching from the tree line or waiting in the mists of the mountains for its opportunity. It greedily hoards treasure, wantonly burns villages, and abducts princesses and virgins. This gives rise to stories of the dragon slayer, the hero who takes up the sword, the shield, or all manner of clever weapons and trickery, and rides out to slay the creature, which is to say the hero is taming nature, subduing it, and fending off the ever-lurking chaos threatening civilization. You could say then that these heroes are chaos slayers. This isn't a phrase anyone uses that I know of, I just wanted to use a term that reflects not the fantastical adventures of heroes as they bravely slay fearsome beasts, but the symbolic destruction of chaos and rejection of untamed nature. This struggle against chaos and against the dragon is sometimes called Drakenkampf, the struggle against the dragon, or more broadly in mythology and religious study, Chaoskampf, the struggle against chaos. We see many stories of Drakenkampf that feature the dragon slayer, such as Marduk and Tiamat, Zeus and Typhon, Heracles and the Lernian Hydra, Thor and Jormungandr, Yahweh and the Leviathan, and many, many more. Let's take a look at several dragon slayer stories and see how the struggle against chaos takes form in the dragon myths of Europe. First, a familiar story in the Christian tradition, St. George and the Dragon. In Roman times, in a village sometimes identified as being in either modern Turkey or Libya, a dragon was blighting the locals by demanding annual human sacrifice and poisoning the land with its breath. The villagers and nobility would randomly choose which family would offer up a child to the dragon by lottery, and things went this way for a long time, with people growing ever more depressed and hopeless. One year, the random choice was a princess, but her father refused to allow her to be sacrificed. This enraged the villagers who rightly felt cheated. They took the princess from her home and led her out to be sacrificed. In most of these stories, the princess is actually depicted as being brave and going to the sacrifice willingly. About this time, St. George, who was a Roman soldier, was riding by and saw the princess waiting there ready to be sacrificed. He began to save her, but still being brave and having a sense of duty, she refused his offer and even told him to leave. Get lost, this is the way of things. Here, the princess seems to be accepting the idea of sacrifice to ward off chaos, which if we want to read into it, could represent older mythological traditions centered on the goddess, on the earth, and on sacrifice and natural cycles. St. George, however, was from a different tradition, and he wouldn't leave her. Soon, the dragon appeared, and St. George charged the creature. He severely wounded it, and as they battled, he asked the princess to toss her girdle to him. He tied the girdle around the dragon's neck, and as soon as he did, it became docile. The girdle is a symbol of chastity and protection, but ultimately, chastity has power because of the underlying feminine power, so that's another way to read this. 
Feminine magic, that is, magic of new life and of the earth, subdues the creature of chaos. St. George and the princess led the dragon along back to the village, where the population was terrified to see it walking along their streets. St. George promised to kill the dragon if the people of the village promised to be baptized and convert to Christianity, which they readily agreed to, and the docile dragon was slain. What I find fascinating about this story is that St. George had already pacified the dragon with the girdle before using the people's fear to convert them to Christianity. The dragon posed no threat as long as the girdle was around its neck, and yet St. George still made his offer and the population agreed. It's better to destroy it than to understand it, better to remove the perceived threat than to entertain the idea that it might have something to offer. Since the dragon represents chaos, we can take this to mean that order is more important than understanding or that being saved from chaos is preferable to embracing it. You might rightly say, well, the dragon was demanding sacrifice. It was causing all kinds of sorrow. Why would you not kill it? The key is in the princess's actions. She understands that the dragon is a symbol of chaos and natural forces. In the Near East, ancient mythologies incorporated chaos into the idea of terrifying natural change, which would bring with it bounties of food and resources. For example, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, a great flood hits Mesopotamia and even the gods themselves cower from it. However, in the aftermath, there is an abundance of fish and plant life, even as the bodies of many people are swept away. So basically, chaos is going to happen. Get ready for it. But ultimately, it will bring bounties. This was how the Mesopotamians incorporated their natural surroundings into their myths. Seen another way, the feminine power, perhaps symbolizing these older religions, is used by the Christian hero, but destruction of chaos and conversion to Christianity is more important than the old magic. In a way, this could be saying, out with the old religion, in with the new. Our new religion is stronger. You don't have to live with chaos or accept natural forces. Just convert and all that stuff won't bother you anymore. This is just one way to interpret it, and the story isn't the only one to seemingly make this statement. Following up with that idea of destroying chaos rather than understanding it, there is a story very similar to that of St. George and the Dragon. It's also a Christian story involving a saint saving a town from a dragon, but it doesn't end quite the same way. In medieval France, there was a creature terrorizing the region of Provence in the southeast of the country. Legend said that the Tarasque was the spawn of the biblical Leviathan. It was described as having a lion's head, six legs, a snake-like tail, and impenetrable armor in the shape of a turtle-like shell. Its size wasn't what we would expect from a dragon, though. The Tarasque was huge, but only on the scale of livestock, as it was said to be bigger than any ox. Some stories said that it breathed poison, too. While this creature was doing the chaos thing, terrorizing the town of Tarascon, what was then called Nerluk, and all attempts to kill the creature failed. This continued for a long time until a maiden arrived. This was Saint Martha, who promised to help the town, and so set out into the dark forest. There, she came to the Tarasque's lair, where the creature was distractedly dining on a shepherd. She snuck up to it, and just as it realized she was there and began to attack, St. Martha held out her crucifix and sprinkled holy water on the Tarasque. The Tarasque was completely pacified and lay down obediently at St. Martha's feet. She crafted a leash made from her own hair, mirroring the girdle from the St. George story. And just like the story of St. George, Martha then led the creature back into town to help convert the population. St. Martha apparently had no intention of killing the creature, but instead wanted to show that the power of the Lord could pacify even the most savage beasts. Again, the female in the story is more accepting of chaos and the forces of nature, and a symbol of femininity, the leash made from her hair, helps pacify the beast. However, the townsfolk were not going to let that fly. They grabbed whatever they could, stones and sticks, and pummeled the docile creature to death in the street. Presumably, they also converted. 
well, slightly different from the story of St. George. Again, I think it's interesting that the people of Nerluk absolutely refused to allow the Tarrasque to live, even though it had been pacified. If we're following the idea of Drakenkampf as the symbolic struggle against the untamed forces of nature and chaos, then the story of St. Martha and the Tarrasque says a lot about how these people felt toward these ideas. Even proving that the Christian God could help pacify these powers and bring safety, the people's fear and perhaps need for retribution against the creature was too great to allow the dragon to remain alive. In other words, they would rather destroy this force of nature and chaos than live with it, even when it's no longer a threat. Also, we see again that the female's acceptance or tolerance of nature is overruled, which could be representing a rejection of older mythologies and religions where nature and the goddess was at the center. This conquering of nature is a running theme in Christianity, it seems. In Genesis, God says, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, etc. You could contrast this with many mythologies and religions where the earth and everything that lives on it are sacred and part of a cycle to be respected, a cycle in which we participate and see the divinity in all living things, Buddhism, Hinduism, many Native American and Mesoamerican traditions, for example. This story of St. Martha is a great example of the idea of subduing nature and being its master, a rejection of chaos and nature. In modern France, there is a festival celebrated every year on the last weekend of June, which commemorates St. Martha and the Tarasque. The celebration has taken on additional context from just the myth, but still, there's a giant Tarasque that parades through the town and it's amazing. In Krakow, Poland, during the reign of the fabled King Krak, a destructive and aggressive dragon was causing widespread suffering. The dragon of Wawel Hill, or just the Wawel Dragon, in Polish Smok Wawelski, would regularly attack and burn farms and homes, and like the villagers in the story of St. George, the people of Krakow, which was not yet a great city, tried to appease it by offering it cattle and sheep. Luckily, the people of Krakow didn't have to go as far as to offer humans to the dragon. King Krak was looking for a way to end the dragon's terror, and he offered his daughter's hand in marriage to anyone who could rid Krakow of the creature. Warriors came from near and far, but were all devoured or burnt to ashes. Hope seemed lost until an unlikely hero came up with a plan. In one version of the story, assistance came from a humble cobbler, or cobbler's apprentice for added humility, who suggested a clever trick. The cobbler's name was Scoop, or Scoopa, and he suggested slaughtering a calf and filling its skin with sulfur and offering it to the dragon. The king, out of options and low on hope, saw potential in the plan and told Scoop to go ahead. The next time the dragon appeared from its cave, Scoop had already placed the sulfur-filled calf skin as an offering just outside. When the dragon ate it, it became so thirsty that it immediately flew into the Vistula River and drank and drank until it burst. Scoop the cobbler married the king's daughter, and the city of Krakow was founded above the dragon's cave. This legend is still popular, and the dragon's cave is an actual place below the royal castle. So, another example of the evil dragon being destroyed, this time not through brawn, but through cleverness and trickery. Finally, the story of Fafnir and Sigurd from Norse and then later Germanic tradition. I did a full narrative of this story in an episode of Myths by the Fire, but I'll break it down here quickly. Basically, a dwarf named Oter, who would shapeshift into an otter, is killed by Loki, Odin, Thor, and the god Heonir, who thought he was just a big otter who could make a good pelt. They go to the hall of Oter's father, King Hreidmar, who is enraged when he discovers what they've done. He demands they cover his son's pelt in treasure, with not a single hair showing from underneath. Loki goes off and gets the treasure, including a ring that brings doom to anyone who keeps it. He covers the pelt in the treasure, but leaves a single hair poking through. The father, Hreidmar, sees this and demands a final piece of treasure to cover the hair. 
Loki warns him about the curse, but places the ring in place. Well, Hreidmar's other son, Fafnir, goes crazy with greed for the treasure and kills his father. He takes the treasure into the mountains and is slowly consumed by greed until he transforms into a dragon whose poisonous breath blights the land. The final of Hreidmar's three sons, named Regan, was the foster father of Sigurd, an orphan of a slain king. Regan charges Sigurd with going and slaying his brother, the dragon Fafnir. To do this, Sigurd must dig a pit under the path where Fafnir goes to the water and thrust his sword up from underneath into a weak point in the dragon's scales. Sigurd digs the pit, but Odin appears to him and suggests adding more trenches to catch the dragon's blood. Sigurd does this and slays the dragon, gathers the treasure, and drinks some of Fafnir's blood and gains the ability to understand birds. In some version, he eats part of the heart. From the birds, which are sometimes named as the ravens Hugin and Munin, he overhears that his father Regan plans to kill Sigurd to take the treasure for himself. So Sigurd goes and kills Regan, thereby eradicating the dragon greed infecting his family, at least from everyone but himself. Interesting aside, there's a theory that this familial greed was one reason the Vikings buried their dead with all their possessions, treasure included, either in a burial mound or sending the funeral boat to perish in the waves. Certainly these funerary practices had symbolic and religious meaning, but the theory suggests a secondary, more utilitarian purpose. If the gold and possessions were lost or buried, there would be less chance for a greedy fight for inheritance or a threat of familial murder. It wasn't that this never happened, but it does make sense as a theory to reduce the chances of it. It's not a widely known theory, so I don't know if it carries any actual weight. I just think it's interesting. And in this story of Fafnir, of course, we have Chaos Kampf. Sigurd destroys Chaos where he sees it, both in the dragon and in his foster father, Regan. This would suggest that preserving order for the community is more important than familial ties, as there doesn't seem to be any hesitation on Sigurd's part to dispatch his foster father, who would likely also become a dragon and continue to poison the land. On the other hand, you could say Sigurd had no choice since Regan was planning to kill him anyway. So the struggle against chaos is won, at least it seems. Sigurd does not give up the ring after all, even knowing about the curse. For a longer, more narrative version of the story, check out the dedicated Fafnir and Sigurd story I did. So the ever-lurking chaos at the edges of civilization is fended off by the strength and cunning of the dragon slayers, the dragon tamers, the chaos slayers. These stories are just a few of the many dragon slayer myths from Europe, not to mention dragon slayers from other cultures. In the end, it seems that chaos is simply unacceptable to the people of these European stories, and whenever possible, it should be destroyed, rather than understood or accepted as part of life. Chaos is also used as a kind of incentive for conversion. Become Christian and the Lord's power will protect you from all this pesky chaos. Now, Next time, we'll investigate the meaning of the Eastern Dragon, the revered force of nature, and see some of the other side of that coin.